Point's guest. Uh, Danielle here, of course, is the museum director who has really made all of this fantastic conference happen. And she's going to talk to us today about Mimbra sourcing clays and the trade system in the area. So, Danielle, take it away, please. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. So thanks Bob and welcome everyone. I just want to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the university and the museum. It's definitely exciting for us to host this and as a members researcher, I'm learning a lot from the perspective of firing using the primitive methods. So before I kind of jump in, I want to give a little background as to how I got to this point in my research. I've been an archaeologist in the Members Valley since 2013. I first worked on the Pitt House site of Harris, which was one of the first two sites used by Emil Howard in the 1930s to define the Mogollon culture. I usually take the road less traveled with member ceramics. I tend to work with the corrugated or textured wares instead of the decorated pottery. And so I wanted to look at all these early corrugated wares from a penthouse site and see if they meant something outside of just utilitarian cookwares. When it came to just the basic coils, there seemed to be a standardized method that the entire site used. So probably early households formed some kind of community of practice and over time, those coil measurements just stayed the same. I never had two instances of coils being manipulated to have additional designs that stood out. The first was Pit House 43. It was one of the earliest pit houses on the site, and about 16% of their assemblage was a very unique style that we were finding on what would have been their roof. So something very visible, perhaps saying, you know, we're an original fan. The other was from Cluster 4, which was between three and four pit houses. We had also a very unusual design being shared between those households. But instead of on the roof, these are more in the floor and in the floor features, so probably something more internal just for the household. However, there was another cluster that had attempted the pattern, but had no idea how to make it, and so they just could not get the precision they were looking for. This presentation is going to focus on my forever ongoing doctoral research. It is again looking at identity, not just from members to member site, but what happens when we're potentially de dealing with non-local populations, um, and how to navigate identity when you may be someone who is considered foreign from the member. So brief overview, I'm just going to start with the members and Upland Mogion and kind of where they start to differentiate in the timeline, move on to the Elk Ridge site, which is my dissertation site, and then talk about instrumental neutron activation analysis, which is the primary method I am using to get at clay sources, and then bring in some of the different stylistic aspects between the members and Upland. Move on to the results and then wrap it up with some summaries and hints at how I'm going to keep looking at this um, in future projects. So we, oh, I am missing the slide on my notes. Okay, so the Moyo culture has a pretty large span. Um, we do know the Hohokam to the west and the Anasazi, which we now refer to as the ancestral Pueblo groups, which would have included Chaco to the north. And these boundaries are not very clear cut. We get a lot of gray zones in between. Uh, the Mim the Mogollon itself is divided into numerous branches, the most well known and most well studied, of course, being the Membris. We have what is called the San Simon to the west, but there have only been at about two or three sites discovered so far assigned to them. And of course, the Hornada over to the east, and that branch is actually fairly large to the point that it's also being now subdivided into a western Hornada, which seems to be more Pueblo, and an eastern, which seems to be more Plains-based. Also be talking about the Upland Mogion, who are just north of the members. They're kind of in this space between the members and the ancestral Puebloan groups. And then we are unsure how far south the Mogion go down into Chihuahua. We know for sure there are sites in and around Model Ortiz. So when we talk about the members, there tends to be a thought that they're just limited to what we refer to as the Members Valley, but they're actually quite widespread throughout southwest New Mexico. 
There are very large 100 room pueblos inside the city limits. I know folks who live downtown who roll gardening will pull up shirts. We also have a significant large cluster over in the cliff area west of here. They have a pretty big interaction sphere on top of that. Uh, early in the penthouse period, we have a lot of Hohokam style influence um, in early painted wares. Uh, thousands of shell bracelets coming from the Gulf of California and the calls possibly from the Gulf of Mexico. The general member's timeline is divided into three periods. First, with the early pit house, this is our early villages, all with the semi-subterranean circular over households. Plainware first shows up about 8200, and then we start to see the polished, slipped, and fugitive redwares. The late pit house period is further divided into three distinct periods as we see architecture changing and different ceramic styles starting to emerge, uh, beginning uh, with uh, Mogio and Leonard Brown, which kind of quickly evolves into the style one, which is the first appearance of the bullfist, black on white. Uh, the Pueblo period, known as the classic, is when they move to those above ground structures and learn pottery kind of reaches its height uh, specifically with style three middle, which is where we see most of those figurative designs come from. This is also the period where the polychrome pottery starts to emerge. Between 11 and 1130 and 1150, what used to be called, you know, the Great Migration out, the members disappear. It's not really what happened. Some do leave, but we are really seeing a restructuring of the population. They still tend to live in Pueblos, but they tend not to be masonry. They tend just to be straight adobe over time, and those have really degraded. So moving on to the upland, um, in areas of western New Mexico and eastern Arizona, just north of the Membrus, based on research that has done, they seem to have access to the same suite of resources but seem to lag when it comes to their dependence on agriculture. Temporally, as they change architecturally and the ceramics, they tend to follow what we see with the Membrus, but maybe 50 to 75 years behind. When, uh, so during you know, these early phases with the Membrus, what we call the early pit house, late pit house, here it's Pine Lawn, Georgetown, et cetera, we really see the same ceramic styles. That same sequence starts with plain, we get the red wares, this early kind of red on brown that moves to a red on white and then a black on white. But we're not really sure what's going on production wise. Most of the upland sites were dug pre-1960 and so we really are lacking a lot of the detail that we have for members excavations. When we and so the ceramics are similar, but there's one difference uh, with the upland. They have their smudged wares, which is on the interior of bowls. They have burned a thick black organic layer, which they then highly polish. And I always like to say, it kind of has an obsidian look. It's very glassy. And they seem to have that nailed down possibly by 8400. And it's something the upland continue to do for a thousand years. When we get to the three circle and reserve phase, the decorated ware really starts to be distinguished from the membrous uh, branch. The upland modion never do figurative designs. Instead, we see a lot more influence coming from the Cibola groups. And you'll get an uh, example here, these kind of just opposed hatched and solid elements. Room blocks early on are also very small and tend to be L-shaped. And then when we start to see the members depopulate, the upland actually increases in population. A lot of these smaller sites aggregate to become four to 600 room pueblos. So there's a possibility that some members people also moved north. Go back really quick. So I wanted to point out my dissertation site is right up here, the Elk Ridge site. It's considered the last large Memphis, Memphis Pueblo in the valley proper. We're kind of thinking it's getting up to an area where we're starting to see a lot more blend between the upland and the Memphis, which 
is hopefully going to explain why I'm seeing some ceramics that really differentiate Elk Ridge from the rest of the large pueblos in the Memphis Valley. So like I said, Elk Ridge is the last large classic period Pueblo in the Members Valley, and we think about 200 rooms. Outside of the actual prehistoric occupation, the site has gone through some pretty extensive history. We know somewhere in the 1980s, the landowner of the southern portion started to excavate, and then immediately prior to the passage of the New Mexico Burial Law in 1989, he started to backhoe the property. So all of this kind of ticking was the damage that he did. We get some pretty amazing oral history out of the valley during this period from those lined up along the fence line bidding on the pots as they came out of the ground to the landowner actually coming into town with his favorite pots in the back of his car to show off to anyone that was interested. Pretty immediately, there was a new landowner on that section. He was a bachelor student at U of M working in archeology, span and he really saw the need to kind of fix what had happened and try to get any information that was left out of the site. He partnered with the cultural resource firm and they embarked on a few year project and they were actually quite successful. We think there's probably four, maybe five <coughs> room blocks. They discovered one great kiva and a pretty unusual for the members valley, about 20 turkey burials. At the same time in 1990, the Forest Service started working on their portion of the site, which is the northern half. By about 2010, they realized that this arroyo that was popping up was causing more damage than really they could handle. So 20 to 15, 2015 to 2018, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas conducted field schools and excavations. And this is how I got involved in the project. I was on the crew and the ceramic analyst, analyst for all four years. So our focus was just this arroyo and the rooms immediately adjacent and the row behind. Um, they wanted full excavation so they, the Forest Service could put up gabion baskets so that the rest of the site could be protected. And hopefully, as since we went to that row behind, they're hoping that it could be a permanent solution and that we won't have to go in and disturb anything else. Um, that did include excavation of burials. We were in tribal consultation because this site is pretty close to the road and the looting was starting to pick up again. Um, we did excavate all burials and we are still in the process of repatriation. COVID kind of put us back a few years, but uh, we're getting close. And so hopefully uh, next summer, I think, is when that's scheduled to finally take place. We only had one room block since the area we focused on was quite smaller. We had one transitional pit house, so these semi-subterranean structures, they were using the same walls and then building on top to create uh, the later above ground adobe. We had a large communal ramada, a midden or trash area, and overall about 19 rooms that were split between habitation and general storage. We also had a significant amount of turkey burials on our side. And with our analysis of the turkey, it seems that they were never eaten. Uh, we don't have any evidence of processing, so we think that we probably were a source for turkey feathers. So in excavating, we started to come across some strange things. Some of our walls were, looked too nice to be membrous. Uh, when you kind of get a feel for members archaeology, their walls are kind of sloppy. It's just any kind of river cobble or boulder they can find shoved into an adobe and kind of held together with a prayer. Uh, but as we were excavating, we started to see some, what I would call more brick-like rocks, things that have been worked and stacked, which is something that we see with the upland modium. As they moved to Pueblo, again, that Cibola influence wasn't affecting their pottery. They also had these kind of brick-like walls. Some of the burials were also standing out. They weren't fitting the typical membrous pattern, although membrous patterns are usually not patterns at all. They tend to do whatever they want. But we were seeing things, a lot of individuals just had plain or smudge holes over their face or smaller vessels around their shoulders, which fit with the upland pattern. And then I got to the ceramics and they just started going all over the place. 
A lot of, I was seeing that smudge wear, which I knew had previously always been associated with trade, but we just kept getting more and more and more. And so during the analysis process, I was thinking this is too much to be trade. When compared to other member sites, they maybe have one or two of these reserve or upland style bowls, shirts that they can count on one hand, where I'm looking at double digits in percentage for these shirts. So luckily we have some great oh, chemistry and very math heavy resources that can kind of help us answer these questions. So most of the time in the early days when we were looking at trying to figure out manufacturing sources for the members pottery, we relied on petrography or thin slicing. But it seems that most potters in the valley were using the member stand, which looks pretty homogenous under the microscope. And we were really only getting at general areas, South Valley versus Middle Valley versus Upper versus you know, maybe closer to the Black Range, maybe more west to what would now be Silver City. However, in the 1980s to 1990s, we saw this rise in neutron activation analysis. And what it is is a chemical clay sourcing technique requires a very small sample, which is also preferable for member ceramics. All we have to do is bore off the surface using a sterilized Dremel tool, and then we only need 0.3 grams of the interior clay body to source. All of our samples are processed by the uh, Missouri University Research Reactor. Yes, it requires a nuclear reactor to process all of these samples. And it's measuring the gamma rays emitted by different elements. It has the capability of reading about 70 elements, but only about 20 are really necessary to understand uh, member ceramics. And what we have figured out is that really all these clay sources are distinct enough so that we are getting manufacturing locales to the site level. But we've had to figure out which side goes to which source. We first start off looking at the criterion of abundance. So say we excavate, we get 100 pots, we send all 80, all 100 out, and maybe six come back the same, 60 come back the same source. And so we say most likely those 60 represent this specific site. We can then further test that by looking at things that would not probably would not have been moving. Uh, raw clay sources at Elk Ridge were lucky, it was right below the Pueblos. We then also tested the adobe they were using on their structures, figuring that clay was probably also worked in. And then we had unfired pottery made by children. And as we get more samples, these groups do become more defined, and we also get more groups, which complicates everything, but uh, as we get more samples, we really have the members of Valley fairly nailed down, and now we're starting to expand out um, to the upland and the other branches. So what have we learned so far with NAA? Like I said, we've really got a hammered down view of production centers. Each site in the Members Valley has at least one, some have two or more. We also see the patterns of pottery movement over time. Starting when they move into the classic period, sites kind of from the middle on south of the valley seem to stop producing their own pottery. Looking at environmental data, we think it may have just been too dry, and so they would have needed to save their resources for something else. So really these large sites kind of central on up are all massive producers of pottery. We've also really started to reflect on styles and being able to pinpoint specific potters. Before NAA, we would just say, let's look at all the fish. And you know, where are the fish kind of primarily coming from? If they're coming from sports, okay, they're all probably made at sports. But with NAA, we're starting to see distinct groups come up. So it's no longer looking at fish, it's what do their gills look like? Because we're starting to see very specific gill designs, perhaps for lack of better words, acting as signatures of potters. <laughs> Same thing with deer. A lot of the deer images were always kind of lumped together, but now we're looking at how are the antlers done, how are the legs drawn, what do the geometric patterns in the bodies look like? So for my research, I was able to submit a total of 92 samples, and it was important for me to sample every single wear. 
a lot of these research researchers tend to just focus on the decorated wear, uh, but I wanted to include everything to see if that would change the pattern, or if we are starting, oh, if we were correct, that you know, decorated wear moved, but nothing else did. And I was lucky with the samples. Not only was I able to submit the vessels that we dug up through UNLV, but that original landowner who was a heavy looter, his son actually gave back everything in 2018 that they had kept to the Imogen L. Wilson Education Foundation. Since I have worked with them a lot through excavations and they've been volunteer based, they have loaned that collection to the museum. And so the goal is to have all of the Elkridge material here eventually. And so with the UNLV stuff, we have very strict controls. We know the exact context. With the Croteau stuff, it's more just site-wide patterns because we have no idea where he pulled um, these ceramics from. We just know that they were from the site. Uh, he was very strict in that he only ever excavated his own site and never really traded his pots uh, between other collectors and looters. So I'll start with the redware because I only had two of them. And this kind of fits with the overall pattern in the members that as they move into Pueblos, production of redware just seems to stop completely. Uh, we don't really understand why. Uh, Material-wise, they would definitely have not been out of hematite. It's everywhere. And so it's just kind of one of these weird conundrums. Uh, later on, when the members are gone and the slotto move in, redware comes back. And so there is some, something maybe cosmological that's, you know, we're no longer producing this. So of the two, uh, we had one made at Elk Ridge and then one is assigned to a site that we don't really know where it is, it just happens somewhere in the upper valley. What's interesting with the red wares is this one, as you can see, is still very shiny, still has that polish intact. The other one had been heavily used. And so it brings up kind of another question we've recently kind of looked into with the members is all, are all these vessels recently made or are we looking at the possibility of heirlooms and things being kept generation to generation? So not much information from the Webers, but we do know they are made locally and they do move throughout the valley. Uh, for plain wares, I had 12 samples, 11 were made at the site with only uh, one being sourced to a newly defined group, and that's this one right here. It's got that classic upland smudging, uh, so I pretty much thought right away, yeah, this is probably coming from somewhere else. This bowl's actually fairly small. It's only about six centimeters in diameter, and it was with three others that looked exactly like it. So we decided to only one run the test on one of them uh, because the other three would probably also be that source as well. So this source is just, it was known as the Cibola source. And with my uh, samples, it actually split that source into three distinct ones. We don't really know where the source is, just that it's in the general Cibola area. But with the plain wares is when I first started to notice what I called the two distinct smudging traditions. This very glossy black, which I associated with the traditional upland identity. This is something they did for a thousand years, something that's usually on 60 to 80% of their pots. And so it's upland. But then I started seeing this kind of gray attempt to which I ascribed to the members people not knowing how to do the smudging and probably never being taught. If this is something that is distinctly upland, they probably would not have shared that technology. But when it comes to 11 of those 12 sourcing to Elk Elkridge and half of those have that glossy black, now I have to start thinking. If this is truly something that only the upland people do, they're not teaching members people, I have funny looking architecture. I have these burial practices that are different. I have upland population at the site. Moving on to the corrugated wares, I had a total of 32 that I was able to sample and this is where the results kind of just start going all over the place. 18 of the vessels were made at the site 
and they generally fit uh, what we would consider a uh, typical membrous pottery uh, for corrugated. So the, the full body membrous and then the outgrowth of the three circle neck corrugated moving down into the body. Uh, this one way up the end is actually typed as reserve in size, but we do now think it's probably uh, both the members and Upland are doing this type at the same time, and it just grows out individually from each group. So when I saw these, I wasn't necessarily surprised when they came back to Elk Ridge. The thought was corrugated wear never moves. It's always found at the site it was made. So those results weren't surprising. However, that only counts for about half the corrugated wares. We had a number coming from all over the place, including Cottonwood Pueblo, which is only about a mile south of Elk Ridge, and an unknown source somewhere in the Borough Mountains, which we have kind of determined is actually a source of corrugated wares for all sites in the Members Valley. The center vessel, which is a pretty hallmark example of reserve indented smudge, comes from the TJ Ruin. Uh, TJ is a member of Pueblo just right next to the Gila Cliff dwellings. But it seems to be similar to Elk Ridge. It's in this gray zone, and it's never really been looted or excavated, so we only really rely on what we can see on the surface there. And ceramics really point to, again, this hybrid culture. Um, we're seeing a lot more seedable whiteware up there in addition to the member styles and, of course, this reserve smudging. We had another smudge vessel come from the Swart site, which is also kind of in the middle of valley, and NA has shown that that site probably also has an upland population because they are also heavily, heavy producers of the smudge flares. However, I had four vessels come back unassigned, which doesn't help me that much. Um, but I have two of them here, the ones on either side. What's interesting is though they were unassigned, all four chemically match each other. So all four came from the same place. They are all upland styles, and so it could be example of a trade event, or most likely probably one of the upland families, their movement into the site. This is probably what they had brought with them. So much like when we were seeing the smudging on the plain wares, we're also getting this local manufacturer on the corrugated wares, consistent with Hallmark Upland Odeon. The center bowl here was part of a ritual cache left behind on the floor in room 101. The room behind this, room 117, also had a very similar reserve smudge and dented bowl also left on the floor. On the other side are a bowl and jar assigned to a Tularosa pattern corrugated, but that bowl also having a smudged interior, and it's one of the best examples that we had from the site. And then, although I'm not going really into detail here, like I said earlier, when we look at these other large member sites, when it comes to this reserve pattern, getting the smudged wear, it's one or two bowls, and that's it. And these are sites that are extensively excavated. It's not something they would have missed. When it comes to general shirts, they can count between five and 10. So it's not any significant portion of the assemblage. But at Elk Ridge, much like Swartz, we're getting double digits into the shirts, 18% of our uh, total assemblage, which is quite a high amount. And then we're seeing these reserve vessels in all contexts, uh, from household to the feasting area to in the Ramada to burials. So what about the, the decorated wares? I was able to test 46 decorated wares, and the results were also very varied but very different from what we're seeing with the corrugated. In terms of just basic decorated styles, because I was seeing all this smudged where I was definitely looking for that typical upland pattern of these opposed solid and hashed elements. Similar to this, although that's not the best example of what upland style was, there's only about three examples from the site. And so I began to think maybe the upland identity is tied to the corrugated, but the members were really more strict in that when you make a decorated pot, you kind of follow our general trends. The reserve never did figurative designs, 
And so it was probably kind of a give and take. You can do your smudge wares, but when you paint, you do this. Uh, the center bowl uh, was part, again, of that ritual cache. Oh wait, I'm on the wrong page here. <clears throat> so overall, 27 of the decorated wares were produced at the site. Uh, two were somewhere in this kind of mystery upper valley location. We had one from the lower valley, which we think represents the ED site. Five from Cottonwood, one from Swartz, which is this bowl at the end uh, with this figurative, which has been a bowl that has been sought after for a long time. And uh, Croteau's son had it, so now we have it and are able to study it. Uh, one from Nan Ranch, one from Gawaz, two from Maddox, one from the general West Fork area, and five from the Sapio drainage. Judging by these results, one could conclude that Elk Ridge may not have been involved with the pottery trade that we see going on with the other larger pueblos in the valley. We really see between those sites a lot more equal numbers. You know, you'll see this site has 50 from Galaz, you know, 50 from Nan moved to Galaz, but then 50 from Galaz moved to Nan. And so I was wondering if Elk Ridge was involved in this at all, if we're getting just one or two random pieces. However, when I looked at the numbers the other direction, we're finding hundreds of Elk Ridge pots at these pueblos. So is this something that we're just not seeing the other half of the trade? Elk Ridge maybe wasn't getting pots in return, it was more food or perishables like baskets that we don't know? Or did they just tend to not want pots from the Southern Valley? Our results show that they tended to just stay locally with their imports or look more north. So perhaps our kind of ideas of community and how these groups communicated with each other is different depending on where you are in your valley and your general population makeup. However, outside of just this general movement of pottery, there were two things that came up that were quite interesting. Uh, one was the evidence of sharing clays between sites, and the other was possible family or potter control. So this first kind of unusual thing was the sharing of clays between sites. These pictures are not the best, but from uh, my perspective, these were made by the same potter. Uh, statistically, the thickness of the bowl itself and the painted designs are within the 95 percentile. This kind of scraping of the slip is also visible here, and then the interior method of smoothing out the vessels. You can tell it was the same tool used in both. But we're seeing different clay sources for each. Cottonwood Pueblo, uh, just a reminder, is only about a mile south of Elk Ridge. So really prehistorically, that's not a large distance. They were probably in contact with each other on a daily basis. So this is maybe something that may not have been unusual for them, but from our standpoint, you know, the archeological standpoint, this is the first time we have evidence of clay sources being shared between sites. So as the research continues, it may end up not being that big of a deal, but it's something that's a big deal right now. And just another question that's kind of popped up while trying to answer another question. So before I move on to this possibility of control, I kind of want to set the stage of how I'm not the first person to notice this. Dr. Harry Schaefer, when he was creating the micro styles using the ceramics he excavated, excavated from Nan Ranch, he created what he called the transitional style of style two slash three, which he seemed to think belonged in the time period of 8970 to 1020. One of the hallmarks of that type were these small drop pendants or triangles attached to the last thin line of borderlines along the rim. He was also started to notice some similarity of the vessels in general that actually led him to think that this may actually be one potter or potter family and not just something that's chronologically distinct. So that brings in members, the Elk Ridge's second source, members 1A. It's unusual from the beginning as only decorated wares are produced using this source. Drop pendants are common, so it's these little triangles 
coming off of these border bands. Also tend to notice this exceptional line work, some of the thinnest lines I've ever seen on Memphis pottery. The clay body itself tends to be gray in color versus the standard Memphis brown. And they also tend to be very thin. The slip also has a distinct feel. It's kind of hard to describe, but it almost feels wet and chalky at the same time. It's kind of mind blowing, but I picked it up right away as being very distinct. This only represents a few of the examples from Elk Ridge that sourced to, uh, to this locale. Um, we had a lot of them were in burials, um, but usually if I know a pot is from a burial, I tend not to show it. So these are all things that were either ritually left in the household, and these three big ones were all together in the Ramada. Something else I want to point out with the source at Elk Ridge, they were all coming from ritual context. So ritual closing of a house, feasting in the Ramada, and burials. When it comes to those found at other sites, I don't really know exactly those contexts for sure. But when I found out there was a large number of these at other sites, I kind of went on a little quest to figure out if I could see a pattern across more that source to this locale. So one of the first pots I ever put together here, so far as a director, was this one at the top, the kind of horned toad with very human-looking hands. As I pulled it out of the bag, I immediately felt that slip. And when I turned it over, the first shirt I saw was the one with the hand and the eyes. And I had some flashbacks to this one that I had recovered from Elk Ridge. And then as I continued to clean the shirts, I saw those drop pendants. I reached out to the researcher who was the primary uh, archeologist working with NAA in the Memphis Valley. And I asked, I maybe even told him, I bet you this is Memphis 1A. He had sampled it and he confirmed that indeed it was. At that point, he sent me the photos of all the vessels that had been assigned to this type. Some of which I have included here and I started to see a lot of similar things pop up. These large round eyes are very symmetrical circular eyes, a distinct head shape, the very detailed line work, the very pointed and symmetrical drop pendants, and a tendency to use these small human hands whether or not the main image itself was a human figurative design. And these characteristics carry over to about 95% of the pots that were recovered from this source group. So is this a single potter or is it a family that has control over this source and perhaps they just share the style? When he put this at 970 to 1020, some of these vessels technically date after that. So I've been kind of working with him to maybe see if we can renegotiate the time period, or if we maybe are looking at multi-generational that just tend to use the same designs. So if it is control over the source, perhaps this individual or family were the only ones who knew where it was. We have yet to find it. Um, I've also found numerous bowls at the museum that share these characteristics that have not yet to be tested. So this is just an example of some of the ones that I have come across. Again, seeing these very distinct hands, the drop pendants, the large eyes, and the overall just symmetrical, very fine line work. So it's kind of nice. I have this little playground that I can use. Um, and then working with that primary researcher for NAA to just sample as much as we possibly can from the museum. So, in conclusion, NAA has been crucial to answering some of the questions regarding members pottery, their manufacture, and movement throughout the region. However, typical with the members, when you answer one question, you create five more. Elk Ridge is unusual. They have at least two clay sources, possibly that sharing of the third, and then there are some of these unassigned ones that we think may end up being Elk Ridge as well. However, these ideas of sharing and control are things that definitely need to be further examined. When it comes to fitting in with the, these established movement patterns in the members, although it seems they are different, the answer really is who knows? 
there is a tendency when we look at anything members related from an archaeological standpoint, we treat the members as one large body. But we are dealing with middle range societies, there is no overarching government, there's no overarching rules on how to live your life. And because previous research has showed that in the members there are at least 32 different environmental zones, each site is probably just adapting as they need to, whether or not they build, whether or not they make pottery, and are probably forming their own community relationships with other sites and with other individuals outside of the members realm. So really, the next step is to really take steps back and look at the NAA results from each site individually and then see if the model or pattern builds up from there. We also see that Elk Ridge is multicultural and a visible non-local population. In addition to that architecture and burial, we have those non-local pots being made locally and also being brought in. And prior to this, a lot of the upland was usually kind of, we'd never see it. These are also Mogion people, so moving in, it would all just blend together. But when we know they're doing the smudging for over a thousand years, and they don't do figurative, and the members are the opposite, even though they may share other characteristics, when it comes to a population or family moving in, there are these inherent ties coming with them that will start to show up. And so though I only focus on the upland, we could probably also do this with the Hornada as well. And then as the Eastern members and San Simone become more defined, we can probably see this with them as well. And any questions? <laughs> I have a question. So you did analysis of the clay. Did you do any analysis of the slip or the paint? No. Um, we have tried to do the slip and it just doesn't match anything. Um, we thought we had one slip source, but I know a local potter in the area who says no matter what they do, it will not fire white. Um, so we've kind of just put that on the shelf for now because we really don't have anything to compare it against. When you were talking about control, mm -hmm. you mean it to be that a potter has found a source and not disclosed it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. okay. Either that or you know, one of the questions I definitely can't answer is if this potter is an upland person, their decorated wares also tend to be a white or gray body. So they may have found this source and said, oh, I know how to work with this clay better. Um, but the fact that it is only decorated wear is unusual. And I have what I think are pots also made by the same person using the other clay source at the site. So something is going on. I don't, maybe those specific pots were, you know, ordered in a sense. You know, we are using this specific clay source, only this potter uses it, but it's four pots and burials, four pots virtually left behind. But it's the members, so they, they didn't leave me any notes. <laughs> Yeah, so for my site, they're, they're building right on top of it. And when we excavated, we always test below the floors, we were hitting it. Um, other sites, they know kind of like a cliff face, that's, you know, a couple meters away. They test it and they're like a perfect match. And then others are more this, we have regional based on, you know, kind of geochemistry data, but we haven't nailed it down quite yet. Your observation about these families potentially like controlling a, a given um, art form. I, I thought about that too, about the artist. You know, kind of like, okay, so Van Gogh, this is a guy that we all really appreciate and, and we try to get that work. And, and I, I, I can see that, you know, in kind of the, the ancient times where if you had, and if I understand you right, there were like 60 pots that appear to have been made in the same place there in the Alp ruin. Um, and, and so I, I wonder if there were like centers, you know, of, of master potters mm -hmm. that 
that's where the trade work could have come from, right? That they were they were sought after because mm -hmm. there were certain uh, really great artists coming from yeah. the area. And it's one of the things that Harry Schaefer, it's kind of his new project, he's kind of thinking of these ideas of market days where, you know, specific potters would have been sought after. Uh, we see the same things with the polychromes. We think it's only one or two individuals producing those because they, the NAA on those, we don't really have nailed down, uh, but there tends to just be two, one, two sources. And when you look at them, they do also tend to start having these specific patterns. Uh, regarding that red to orange color, line work, um, one of them loves to do scrolls. And so it's kind of that we're just now really kind of reevaluating and piecing together everything. I also, when I was kind of looking at these rock pendants, I found another source, I think it's the Gloss site, also had a tendency to use these drop pendants. They're nowhere near as nice and the eyes they do are different. And so I began to think, is this a copycat or is this the next generation who you know uses the drop pendants as that tie in to the family, but maybe just doesn't have, you know, the perfect execution. And the uniformity of those drop pendants, I mean, it's not easy to do those, to have them all come out, you know, basically the same like width and height. Uh, it, is, it is pretty amazing, and they're very small. You know, yeah. Even has been very careful about Yeah, and I, I'm close to the point when a new pot comes in or show, someone shows me a pot, I can pick out almost immediately those drop pendants. Yeah. <laughs> um, I happen to have a couple of shirts with the drop pendant on that were given to me by someone who owned a room. Mm -hmm. And one interesting thing about those, you talk about that silky feel. Uh, when I wet with water that shirt, it, the white becomes translucent. Mm -hmm. It literally becomes translucent. As opposed to some of the other shirts that are not quite as translucent, <laughs> but those ones are translucent. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed it too, washing them, it, you can, just changes on you. You, you can see the clay body underneath the white when it's wet. Yeah. And so it's, I have no idea anything really, but it, it was definitely, you know, when I first felt them, I was like, what is this? I'm like, it's dry and wet at the same time. Um, <laughs> but it, it's one of those things that also, when I get these pots, the second I touch it, I'm like, oh, this is Mimbrous 1A. Now I know. <laughs> Side the walls and things to see like food sources. And, mm -hmm. um, I know it's, uh, some of the tribes in, uh, in the northern part were very trained out to Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. So this area here is so close to that. I wonder if there was any indication of possible trading with. As far as the clay, we don't really have a lot of the southern sources nailed down. Um, when it comes to, you know, a food residue left on, I tried to submit six samples from my thesis because I had a lot of organic residue baked on, and the results all came back in dirt. So. <laughs> um, some have had better success, um, but we're just seeing a lot of local plant life mixed in. Do you want to take a shot at the firing methodology and how? <laughs> so <laughs> I, when I found out that they had never found a kiln here um, on my dissertation site, I was on a mission. And I just surveyed in circles and out as far as I could go. And I never found anything. Um, also ran into a few landowners and asked them, you know, have you seen anything strange out of the ordinary that would maybe show a lot of wasters or ash deposits or just anything? And no, uh, we've looked at trying to do like thermal LIDAR to see if there's any like old burn scars, nothing. 
Um, so I've, I've tended to lean with the theory that they may have been putting these things um, on Arroyos and then just over time they've washed out. Um, because, you know, going for miles around a site and having found nothing um, when my dissertation site's kind of in a perfect area to have one. And it's kind of mind-boggling thinking of the production amount that was coming out of here. When I see, oh, 10,000 decorated wares, that's a low, low estimate. I think probably 100 to 200,000 in just, you know, an 800 year period. And that's just decorated wares, which when we get to Pueblo and you have the corrugated plane were decorated, decorated's the least made. So when you're thinking that's maybe only a quarter of the ceramic production, there's, you know, there has to be significant kilns somewhere. Well, it could be surface fired though too, right? It could be. You know, it's one of those things that, and that's where we're hoping the thermal would help um, especially at sites where we know there's more of a limestone surface, it should, there's been great results with that in other areas of the world where it just kind of bakes it and these liner can pick up, but nothing here. Any more questions? Am I dismissed? <laughs>